So let's get started because we have two super exciting presentations and I've seen the slides and they and I'm sure the ladies are going to go over time so I'm going to get started and get them to present to you guys. So welcome to this webinar about alternative building materials. My name is Marlus Reining and I'm one of the directors of the Regenerative Collaborative of South Africa. In my daily job, I am a sustainable building consultant at Solid Green Consulting, but today I am here as your facilitator for this webinar. So we'd like to start off with thanking our sponsor for today's webinar, which is Daikin uh, Air Conditioning. So Daikin Air Conditioning, they have more than 90 years of experience in air conditioning and climate solutions and are the absolute number one in the world in terms of air conditioning. A perfect climate requires more than just heating and cooling. Daikon offers our customers high energy efficiency units with a contemporary modern design. With a full product portfolio, they allow the units to give the best comfort while giving an aesthetic solution. With Daikin, you can count on maximum comfort and the highest quality standards and the best energy efficiency in the market. Daikin offers a complete range from standard split systems, commercial refrigeration systems to industrial cooling for complete cities. Sorry. <laughs> Daikin strives to promote green solutions by introducing low GWP, global warming potential refrigerants, and helping architects and consultants to design solutions that lower the overall consumption of the building. They are responsible manufacturers that allow their customers to make a sensible choice. They have also installed the air conditioning system for one of the projects that we're talking about today, and we really appreciate a financial contribution to this webinar and making this webinar a, a possibility and you know that the contribution goes towards the CPD validation of the webinar. So thanks to Daikon for sponsoring this event. And then this event is brought to you by Regenerative Collaborative as I mentioned in the beginning. Really uh, we'd like you to follow us if you're enjoying the webinars, uh, join us on LinkedIn or Facebook or even on Eventbrite where you have to register for, for the events and that will keep you up to date to, as to what webinars are happening. But all our webinars are happening on the last Thursday of the month, always at four o'clock. So just diarize it in your diary. If you're keen on joining us, we're a voluntarily organization. And if you want to join us, help us organize these events, you are more than welcome. Just reach out to us. Okay. Any of the previous events that we've hosted in the past, you can find on the Greenet website and it will still be available for CPD points for um, 12 months after the actual date of the event. So if you need at almost the end of the year, usually at the end of the year, we're all scrambling for CPD points. So if you're in need of CPD points, yeah, go to our website and you can take the courses. And then we invite you to share ideas. If you have a great idea for a topic that you would like to see featured on one of these webinars, just write down or we'll share the link to this Google form jot down your idea and if your idea gets chosen you can win 500 rand and today's webinar was uh, selected based on input from um, Matthew Friedman, Friedland and he's going to receive the 500 rand this month. So back to the topic of today alternative building materials and we really have two exciting projects that are going to be featured today one being the Helderberg Multipurpose Center, which will be presented by um, Jackie, and one will be about the highest hemp building in the world, which will be presented by, by Charnay. So we have today, we have two amazing ladies presenting to you today, and I'm going to introduce them to you. Jacqueline Starr, she is a director and project architect at Ibiza, Architects. She joined them in 2013. She has a educational background in architecture from the University of Port Elizabeth, and her professional focus lies with the overall design language and execution of project excellence. And she advocates for a sustainable architecture and green building design. 
In her spare time, she enjoys long walks on the beach. And if she has time to get out of the Cape, she also really enjoys safaris and big fives. So she will be presenting to us today about the Helderberg Nature Reserve Multipurpose Center, which has made use of a range of different building materials. And she will talk you through all those different times. Very exciting. And then our second speaker is Sharnay Bloom. And her background is in sustainable architecture, and she has obtained her master's from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And I can pronounce it because I'm Dutch, so I can pronounce Utrecht properly, as well as a master's from Stellenbosch University Institute, focusing on green architecture and sustainable communities. And she's currently a sustainability consultant at Efrimat and focuses on developing a hempcrete building system. So, so she will today present on the tallest uh, building using hempcrete in Cape Town. So I'm going to hand over to Jackie. Good afternoon, everybody. It's such a wonderful opportunity for me to presenting the Helderberg Nature Reserve Visitor Center to you today. Our practice is predominantly commercial, so a project like this coming into our office is a is a huge excitement for all of us um, to be part of it. So as Marlis has already explained, I'm Jacqueline Stowe, project architect on this project and director at Ibiza Architects. How the project came about is we tended for this project through the city of Cape Town and our joint venture was lucky enough to have one attender and to undertake the design, the development and construction of this new visitor center. So the concept design slide in front of you was the inception of the project. The design of the project was a collaboration between the City of Cape Town's planning department and our JV. We worked to develop the design as a coherent team. We had the same goals in mind and worked hard to maintain the design integrity of natural building throughout the entire process, from work stage one, which you see in front of you, all the way to close out. Right, right. so this is the concept design slide. So we maintain the integrity of the design throughout. Um, the very talented team at City of Cape Town, uh, led by architect and green building activist Ashley Imraj, which I'm sure many of you know of, was an absolute pleasure to have as a client. We were lucky to have a team full of project managers and green building APs to further reinforce the green building aspects necessary to make this a success. Unfortunately, being a city project, we did not have funding to be able to accredit this building as a green building certified building. This indicates the site and a little bit information that you can read by yourself while I'm discussing the site with you. The building is in the Helderberg Nature Reserve, Somerset West Cape Town, and the site is accessible to the public. So I encourage all of you to take a trip there and to go and see it for yourselves. There's something very satisfying about placing your hands on a rammed earth wall, and it's something that you can't actually verbally explain. So in the drawing on the slide, you can see the organic shape of the building, and it totally ignores the shape of the existing admin building to the left, but embracing the natural curves of the environment that sits within. The building opens to the north orientation and to the magnificent views towards the Helderberg Mountains. Existing, the existing summer festival stage is also located within the view range and was a major design consideration when orientating this new visitor center. For these types of events, a grass area around the building was raked for informal seating opportunities and a clip-on Bedouin tent was designed to give shade for the summer concert goers. The design aspect of the building. In essence, the project brief required an extensive use of recycled materials such as reinforced tire and rammed earth technology for load-bearing walls. And this formed the building envelope. And the use of eco bricks was used for the internal decorative walls. Additionally, the project necessitated a strong emphasis on passive design interventions to achieve, achieve thermal performance during seasonal periods. To fulfill these sustainable goals, proven conventional and unconventional green technology solutions were combined to reduce the carbon emissions of the building and to encourage an approach that is rooted in renewable resources. Inspired by biophilic design principles that encourage human engagement with the natural environment through the interaction of direct nature, indirect nature, 
and space and place conditions, the building aimed to form a nexus between humans and the environment. This is evident in the design form, the orientation of the building, and the use of natural materials and the expression thereof. The harnessing of the natural light and passive ventilation, which filters through the internal spaces and roof gardens above. In conjunction with, the, with what I've just said with the passive design, we use Daikon air conditioning with a VRV heat recovery and a mixture of ducted and cassetted units. Although provision was made for the use of air conditioning in extreme weather fluctuations, the building performs extremely well without it, reducing the use of mechanical ventilation and in turn power consumption. Elevations. More elevations. So solar power, black water and rainwater harvesting were all incorporated in the design of the building. As the building functions, not just as a visitor center, but as an educational facility for school groups, we wanted the building itself to be educational. All the finishes are exposed in one way or the other. The functional aspects of the building are exposed and the public is granted access to areas where this can be viewed. As a matter of fact, the building tells its own story. The civil, structural, electrical, and mechanical engineers supported these innovation design objectives by providing hands-on, ecologically sensitive services. Passive design principles, as said before, approached as a second-tier overlay component to the project, which introduced both active and passive solar energy storage and heating systems. The recycling of grey water and harvesting of rainwater to minimize end-user energy cons consumption and management of freshwater usage Processing of solid waste by implementation of a must-come closed loop system was all integrated in the design and development of this new visitor center. Okay, so before we get to the construction photos, one or two more things. The existing topography and natural surrounding landscape elements were also preserved to maintain the original character and essence of the chosen site. The landscaping on the roof mimics the surrounding flora and fauna and reduces the need for irrigation. One question we get asked quite a lot on this project and sustainable project is building plan submission. Um, we were fortunate to have experienced specialists on our team able to provide the local authority with the necessary documentation to get the approvals we needed. Having the Natural Building Collective on board with engineer William, and I'm very sorry but I can't, William has got like a three-letter surname which I cannot pronounce, made the process very easy. We do find that the blackwater treatment systems are more widely acceptable at the moment with local authorities, some being more accepting than others, um, but that can still be challenging. So moving along to the construction of the building and the materials, which I'm sure everybody's interested in. Right, materials used. Aided by the Natural Building Collective, which comprises of Peter, Paul and William, the team workshopped the selection and implementation of the alternative building materials and were able to find practical solutions in implementing these materials into the building design and eventually into the construction process. The outer layer of the building envelope, which was encroached, in, encroaching into the embankment, needed to be waterproofed extensively. This posed quite a challenge as the wall was constructed out of tires and cob. In order to address this matter, the walls were first layered with plaster to secure the cob and then to provide the substrate and to apply the bitumen layers. In this slide, you can see the bitumen layers and the, the cob um, on the tire wall. This was followed by an additional layer of bubble drainage, sand, and then finally a French drain before the embankment wall was re-established. The tire wall started at the base with an 800 millimeter tire and it narrowed towards the top with a 400 millimeter diameter. In this slide, you can see the bubble and the sand layer and the French drain and the piping which aided in the French drain water drainage. The rammed earth walls. The outer rammed earth walls was particularly challenging as it had to house the structural columns needed to support the coffered roof slab enabling the design team to have the hall space free of any internal columns. These columns needed to be within the rammed earth walls, but not interfere with the ramming of the earth around the columns. Due to the columns being housed within the rammed earth wall and the load capacity they had to carry, a concrete foundation had to be built under the rammed earth wall. 
This is usually not necessary and can be built straight onto the compacted ground layer when the carrying weight is proportional to the wall carrying capacity. Local materials used for the rammed earth in two different shades to create the color movement within the wall. Unfortunately, though, we couldn't use the excavated material on site as the clay content was too high. There was also not enough excavated material to be able to use for the compaction of the wall. Just showing the shuttering and the foundation for the rammed earth wall. Here you can clearly see the colors within the rammed earth wall. This was the sample wall and the guys doing the compaction within the shuttering. So the wall, the rammed earth wall ended up being 600 millimeters thick and the sand was mixed with lime to give it strength and a certain amount of waterproofing in the weather conditions. In addition to the lime, we opted to go for a protective coating, which is a siloxane solution that was sprayed internally as well as externally to reduce the impact internally on staining on the walls and externally for the weather over time. The signage wall was chosen to be the sample wall for the rammed earth and remains in place towards the entrance of the building. The internal walls on the slide that you guys are seeing now was constructed out of a timber frame filled with eco bricks collected from various schools in the greater Cape Town area. The walls were contained with chicken wire and plastered with cob. These walls were exposed in various degrees to add the educational story of the building. In some areas, the eco brick fronts and backs were exposed to create interactive murals and wall art. So the roof. The main roof structure was designed to span the entire area of the main hall and to allow both people and plants on the top. This was achieved by using coffer slabs. The balustrades were designed to protect the people from falling off the roof, really. Um, but we didn't place the balustrades on, on the edge of the, the building so that we minimize the visual impact of any balustrades. We wanted lookout points where people could go to the edge of the building to experience the edge of the building. And in these cases, we used glass balustrades. The garden on the roof structure aids in the thermal comfort of the building and includes low growing indigenous planting with drip irrigation. Here you can see the coffer slabs being structured. Here are some of the balustrades. As you can see, they've been pulled back, allowing access onto the roof area. Internal finishes. The internal finishes of the building were kept to a minimum to further reinforce the idea of less is more. To give the natural materials their own stage in providing a backdrop to the functional building and space. Timber donated by the Nature Reserve was used to construct the timber doors in the building. And the use of polished concrete floors, counters and vanities made for a robust long wearing surface with minimal maintenance. Here you can see one of the timber doors, concrete floors. Right. So the sockets and services were also exposed, but the use of Ecofon ceiling panels aided in acoustic treatment in some of the areas. Sorry, I know I'm going back a little bit, but by doing it this with the, the mouse, the slides are skipping a little bit ahead of time. So the planter in the main office area, which is visible on this slide, again encourages the connection between internal and external natural environment. Another design aspect that we loved was the use of the stormwater concrete pipes donated by the roads department. Hopefully that's on the next slide. There we go. Um, it was donated by the roads um, department for the construction of the windows. As these walls are very thick, this was a fantastic way to deal with the window openings required in the office spaces. Skylights were also incorporated on the lower roof area to bring light into the deep spaces adjacent to the tile wall. Seen on this slide, in the bathrooms and in the office spaces. Right, so the sustainable systems and principles. Apart from the sessions hosted inside the facility, the building itself was also designed to educate its visitors on its function and construction process. The ramp on the side of the building, which you can see in this slide, leads people around the structure to engage their senses as they take the full vision of the building. From the exposed tire and rammed earth walls that beckons a visitor's touch as they move around the center to the services placed on the lower roof structure. 
there is plenty to see for everybody moving around the building. The three different wall types showcase the principle of carbon burying. The inner curved wall and foundations were constructed using rammed earth and repurposed building rubble, and the outer curved retaining wall was constructed from the repurposed tires. This massive, massively reduced the amount of cement needed for the construction. As we all know, cement has the highest carbon footprint of building materials. Interesting fact, a total of 830 recycled tuck tires, tuck, truck tires were used on the tire wall, which is approximately 40 meters long and three and a half meters high. So to summarize and some lessons learned and to conclude, it's possible for local authorities to approve building plans for alternative building materials and systems use. It's possible for the city of Cape Town and other parastatals to be the leaders in public buildings that showcase alternative building materials and green technologies. It's possible to design, construct and use alternative buildings in a commercial environment, even if there's no formal rating or accreditation. In this case, we were able to hand over the site in June 2020 during strict lockdown regulations. And although there were challenges regarding procuring materials due to COVID, as well as only being allowed 50% of the site staff component, we still managed to complete, complete this project and stay within budget. The official opening was held in June this year and it was attended by the mayor and the deputy mayor of Cape Town. This project has been published in three magazines thus far, Architect and Builder, Scape and Landscape Essay. And the project also took a third prize in the city of Cape Town's best projects for 2022. So for us as a team and the client body, this has been a great project. Um, so thank you everybody um, for listening and having a look at, at our slideshow. Um, I am able to provide anybody who's interested a full list of consultants, contractors and subcontractors that were um, part of this project. As I know, some people are very interested to engage with contractors that are able to provide technical details and buildability for such a sustainable building. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. That was really nice. And I can see people are loving it as well. We can have Shone present now and then we'll do all the questions at the end. Yeah. Good to go. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lovely presentation. So, okay. So Afrimat Hemp, we are a startup that's connected to Afrimat, which is a mining company in South Africa. And they have a few companies that is connected to, call it natural sort of materials. One being Cape Lime, which is a supplier of CLC Lime, which is for heritage buildings. And then obviously Afrimat Hemp. And then there's a new, a new kid on the block that's also to do with a concrete that has no cement in it, but more about that another time. So obviously a few cities in the world have their hands full with carbon neutrality, buzzwords, legislations, and things like this to achieve by 2030 that obviously spills o spilled over from the UN SDGs and COP21s and COP26s and all of these. I'm not going to bore you guys with this because most of you probably know all of this. Yeah, so basically that's where we came in from a carbon neutrality point of view. Uh, hempcrete is a sort of a low carbon material, but it could probably be if you can source it locally and produce it locally, it could be a carbon negative building material, which is a very interesting journey. My own journey with Hempcrete started in 2018. I took part in a competition, my team, a sustainable development, yeah, sort of a, a bigger team of uh, passionate young university students and young working guys. And we took part in a competition in Morocco, the Solo de Cathal in Africa. This was unfortunately not my building, but this was my neighbor's building. Um, it was a hempcrete building that was built for this competition. So the competition is, there were 20 different teams from different universities in the, in the world. And every team had to compete on 10 different aspects. 
And one thing that impressed me about the Hempcrete building right next to us was that uh, we all had to include an HVAC system. And I know the sponsor is also an HVAC system, but uh, we all had to include an HVAC system. And uh, these guys didn't use any mechanical cooling. So they literally achieved a optimal indoor climate, which in a Moroccan desert setting was anything between, I think it was 18 and 26 degrees. And they managed to, even if it was on 26 degrees, they managed to deregulate the, the um, building without HVAC. I was very impressed with that. Of course, they used some passive cooling elements and principles to help with that, but that's where my journey started. So just a quick uh, update on what is cannabis, what is dacha, what is hemp, what is all these things. So, um, of course, we have, uh, this is very high level, we work in the hemp space, which is the non-psychoactive side. It's You could have strains with CBD and CBG. And, of course, the ones that we are interested in is the ones that's biomass intensive. You get the marijuana plant, which is putting all the strength into the buds and the flowers. That is uh, sort of what we we know in South Africa as dacha, psychoactive THC as the um, cannabinoids. And um, yeah, so like I said, we are interested in the one that's more biomass intensive. So this is an example of a beautiful hemp uh, field. It looks like a bamboo forest actually, but a, a hemp field in somewhere in Asia. China is one of the biggest producers of industrial hemp currently, and Canada and Russia, some of the European countries like France, they're all very keen on, on industrial hemp. In fact, France is probably the country in the world that's uh, built the most hempcrete homes, the oldest hempcrete homes you can find there. They're more than 100 years old, so that's a store yeah some some google work you guys can do um, yeah so basically what is hemp sh uh, hempcrete so hempcrete is uh, comes from hemp shift and you combine that with formulated lime and you find a hempcrete you can find it in two well more than one more than two forms but the two forms that we focus on is uh, hempcrete in situ cost that, that you can see on the right and the left hand side and on the right is a hemp block, which is also what was used at the Harrington project, Harrington Street project that I will share in a minute. We have a plant in a booster, so that's nice. We, Although at the moment, unfortunately, we have to import our shift from uh, Europe, um, but with all the legislation that recently changed in South Africa and a lot of um, industrial hemp permits that's been released to farmers um, and growers, Hopefully we can soon have local shift and have our carbon footprint much lower than it is currently. Yeah, so the plant is in Booster and we also have a plant in Joburg. Exciting. Um, what I wanted to say about the hemp blocks is it's not fired, it's air dried. Um, what's interesting on the circular economy side of things, and also carbon footprint side of things is if you consider that a hemp plant is one of the plants in the world with the most carbon sequestrating properties, it's up there with bamboo, and you consider that part of hempcrete is lime, and to, to actually get lime to cure, it uses uh, CO2. So that means that you sequestrate uh, carbon when you plant, when you grow the plant, and you can grow a plant anything from seed to four to five, six months, depends on when the country do that. And then you can have for the plants that we, or the, the strain that we grow, you can have plants five to eight meters high. So that means that you have quite a lot of biomass that captures CO2. And then obviously in curing and plastering your building with lime plaster, that also uses CO2 to cure. So it's a double sort of uh, sequestration of CO2. So yeah, the Harrington Street uh, project recently in the news, this is claimed to be the highest building in the world that used hempcrete. So this was confirmed by Steve Allen, which is basically the godfather of hempcrete buildings in the world. He's a, uh, I think he's an Irish chap. 
yeah, he came out to actually come and see the building not too long ago. So that was quite exciting. And then we made a little movie with 50-50 and yeah, all kind of interesting things. I mean, of course, we're very keen to not just be up in the flashy parts of of the hempcrete um, sort of world, but to also include this um, subsidiary farmers in from the from the Eastern Cape. So um, if you go on our YouTube channel, you can actually see uh, the video of um, how the story also t tells the story about the, the, the farmers in the Eastern Cape. So basically, um, this is a was a seven story um, facade retention and the top level was um, then an extension. Uh, the outside of the building is still was still, of course, uh, done in brick and mortar, and it, the structure, the substructure, was concrete. The internal walls were done in um, hem blocks. The because it's an Airbnb hotel, the client were, wanted to have nice, very well insulated in the sense of sound. Um, units and so forth, although the sound insulation of a hem block is much higher than what you get with brick and mortar. Um, but so you can use it in, in the instance of a cavity wall or on the left hand side, you can see the single skin that you can use in your buildings. Very easy to cut the block. You literally cut it with a hand saw. You can use both of those pieces, the smaller piece, the, the bigger piece. It's a light block. It weighs about uh, five to six kilograms. Compare the same size block in a cement block is about 16 kilograms. So you can imagine you save a lot of money on your structure. Um, it's lightweight. You can use some uh, conventional ways to tie in brick force. This is like a geo mesh that you see on the left here and then a standard butterfly tie to keep the skins together. This was a, a typical double skin. Then you tie in to the structure, to the substructure with hoop irons. It's something that we're not too unfamiliar with. And this is a typical view of a wall in the early stages of the Harrington Street project. You can see that it, you, this could literally be anything. It could be uh, cement blocks. So this is a, a, a picture again. So we have lime plaster on the left, which is our air plaster, and hemp plaster on the right, which is our hemp plaster. You can see the, the by looking at it, the visuals, it's it's very similar. Even the feel of of the if you use them, it for mortar, um, it feels um, much similar to Daga um, and. Unless, uh, well, I mean, it is obviously um, only lime. There's no cement in the both of these plasters, and um, it is a little bit more floppy, I would say, in the sense of it feels softer and lighter. It's not a, especially the lime plaster is not, uh, as they say in Afrikaans, volksfremd, because it is used in heritage all the time. It's the same product. This is just an example of how a hempcrete wall could, uh, the finished product after it's skimmed by the very um, skillful artisans that worked on the project. Um, also, yeah, on this note, we can give a shout out to RNN that's been amazing in this process. Wolf and Wolf Architects, um, Map, uh, what was the Mapcon? The guys that plastered, they were really so. Um, it was such an experimental site, you can imagine. Um, but they were all great, um, and the engineers and all kinds of different people involved. I can't mention everyone, but uh, yeah. So there you can see on the right hand side a typical picture of the the blocks, and then obviously the hempcrete. It's not very different from normal uh, practice in the sense that you can uh, have your conduits cut with a small little grinder. You cut, you cover it up with your conduit in uh, with a lime plaster and you plaster over and you have a similar look. Again, just a picture of the walls in front is the lime uh, plastered walls. The wall behind is the brick wall. 
oh, this is a bad picture, but this is an example of a typical, in any building practice, if you have a joint between two different materials, you need an expansion joint. So this is a joint between the substructure, which is the concrete beams and the hemp plast on the other side. Same story here, timber and hemp plaster. Um, rhino light on the one side and lime plast on the other side. It's just some practical things that people always ask, so I just include it in the presentation. Then again, of course, if you're going for a wabi-sabi look where you have natural textured walls, beautiful interiors with timber and stone and all kinds of things, I think our hemp blast is an amazing product to use. As you can see here, I can unfortunately not reveal more than this, but yeah, soon hopefully we'll see some more. Just uh, on, uh, I was talking about the, the sort of vertical joints. I think the same is for in um, horizontal joints between different materials. You can see that this was a um, just an example of so the bottom floor of this specific building is there's some. Um, what do you call it, uh, brick and mortar, and then you have your standard, sort of you can do a standard, yeah, just a external wall with your hempcrete uh, blocks. Most important thing about natural systems, in my opinion, is to keep the shoes on, have nice boots, have your coat on, have a good plaster and paint over your walls and have your hat on, have a great covering over your... Um, as a roof roof covering. So same thing um, with this. So in the case, I know a lot of people ask me, okay, so now your system is vapor permeable. So is it waterproof then? Uh, we recently, uh, actually two days ago, received our Agrima certification, which is amazing. We That was quite the journey. Um, so we had to do a lot of testing, and this was our water penetration testing that we did. So basically, Science 10 400 requests that you um, pump, I think it's like 20 or 30 liters of water per hour for 20 hours to a wall. And then you can see what is the response in the water penetration. We are, we were very excited to do this test. So we had a, a professional uh, out to do the measuring for us. And we measured two, five and eight percent moisture in the wall. The wall was like six weeks old from literally the bricks that were built. And a funny story. Um, we decided, no, we're not going to just go for 20 hours. We went for 72 hours and the guy came out the next day and he measured again. It was two, five and eight. So we were very, very grateful that, of course, we can claim it's waterproof because we did the test. One small note that we saw was on the left hand side, we had a junction with a, nor with a normal uh, sort of in situ cast concrete wall. And we didn't, we didn't uh, seal that properly because we were obviously testing the hemp wall, right? But then on that side, we could see there was like some water that went right through, um, which was obviously um, something that you should also consider when you use different materials to always make sure, especially on the outside, to make sure that your, your joints are properly waterproofed and all of that. Um, okay, also on the on the same topic, sort of our fire rating, we did a fire test at the beginning of the year, first day of the year, we went and did our fire test at the um, furnace there in, in Blackheath. Very exciting experience. We had about, we ended on 132 minutes and it was 1,062 degrees on the inside. A very exciting um, taste that we did. I mean, we were all smelling like smoke after this. You can't believe how you smell like smoke, but anyway. And then basically, so we achieved a two hour official rating on our single skin without plastering, which is, I think, very competitive in the market if you consider that um, some of the other products can't reach that with a, with a, maybe with a double skin, but not with 110. Compressive strength, so, our system is non-load bearing, um, which means we don't we don't focus on compressive strength so much. Um, in fact, I think the aim of our compressive strength we're trying to get reached 0.4. These blocks are currently uh, one MPA. Um, 
there's a bit of an angle that happened, a little bit of tip, tipping uh, scale. So the more your thermal properties are, the less your compressive strength are. So, so uh, is. So I mean, I think if you, yeah, if you have, um, say, you have a two R value, uh, one ten wall, then you'll probably reach a compressive strength of much less than one MPa. That's just a, a very interesting thing that we we sort of journey uh, that we picked up on our journey. So our thermal uh, con thermal conductivity currently sits on about 0 0.19, which is not what we're aiming for. We're still sort of tweaking our little mix design, and hopefully we'll soon sit on a better. Rating. So our goal is to to achieve uh, our value of two. I think at the moment we're sitting on 1.5 for a 110 skin wall. So there is a little picture of the vapability, va vapor permeability, and what it basically means is that it's well theoretically it's known that uh, hempcrete is a great. If you have a hempcrete uh, building, you have an amazing indoor climate. So it regulates not only temperature, but it also regulates humidity, which means that I think the the um, with with humidity obviously comes like some vapor and some um, moisture and um, yeah. So I think if you just can remember in using any hempcrete system that it should always stay breathable, which means you have to look at the how you build your system up. So if you want to have a like a system that works the best, you need to have a breathable paint, a breathable plaster on the inside, then your breathable blocks, your breathable paint and plaster on the outside again. Um, and that is just how it is. So we have some of our technical information here. Yeah, so there's the 120. We have a 53 decibel on our single skin uh, wall for sound insulation, which is also great and competitive. I'm not going to go in detail through that. So that's our website. You guys are welcome to go on our website. It's very informative. Also follow us on, our, um, on Instagram if you want. We also on LinkedIn. Um, I think uh, we have a nice, a few very nice informative videos on, on YouTube as well. Um, it's also under Afrimad Hemp. And uh, yeah, just a few shout outs to our products. So this is our 110 block at the moment. We have many different sizes to come, but for now we have the 110, it's 110 thick, it's 190 high, it's 390 over. We're hoping to bring out a block that could sit between stud walls, which would be less than 600 and then three brick course height, um, things like that, a little bit thicker. So you have, you can save on your labor cost. Uh, we have the air plast, which is our breathable lime plaster and mortar. It's obviously formulated not only for hemp building, but also heritage. It's easy. You just add water. The guys love it on site. The artisans, they call it the smears butter, if I can hoist some Afrikaans. So, yeah. And then hemp plast, the same story. It's a lime plaster with some hemp shift in it. Um, it's the one that you can use for your textured internal decor, um, and um, Wobby Sabi look if you want to go for that. And then obviously our air coat is our breathable paints. You have many breathable paints in the market. I know at least at f four different companies. But um, yeah, this is also a nice, um, again, also for heritage. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> that was really great as well. There is a number of questions on the chat. If I can take the liberty as the facilitator to ask the, the first question, I'm very interested in in like how do you get um, like these alternative building materials approved by council? Is it like when an architect starts designing, does it did it stop you from using it or like because I think that's that is the general perception that like you know when you, when you talk about but how are we going to get this approved by council what was the process like and I'd like to hear from both of you maybe Jacqueline you can start like what was the process like to get get those alternative building materials approved 
Marlis, yes, good question. I think for us, the benefit was that our client was the city of Cape Town. So we had the full support of the city of Cape Town behind us um, from mm. the get-go. And that carries a lot of weight when you start talking to the local municipalities. You know, it's basically submitting building plans for themselves. So we were quite confident that we would be able to, to do that. The key in, in this is to have the right structural engineers and performance criteria. The council is, they're basically concerned with who's going to take responsibility. So mm. if you have the engineers on board and the detailing and the technical specifications are done correctly, they're very happy to, to engage and to approve those, those type of new technologies. I think it it's, was easier for us, as I say, because we had the city of Cape Town as our client. I think if, you'd, if you're looking at a residential um, property that you'd like to do rammed earth in, uh, your key would be there to engage with an engineer that has gone through this process in getting a rammed earth wall approved. The structural details that he needs to supply to the local authority is going to be key in getting that approved. Great. Thanks. Thanks. And maybe you can share, um, I don't know if you can copy paste it from your from your slide, but maybe share the professional team in the chat um, with the with the rest of the attendees. That's quite um, a long list. Um, okay. I'll, I'll try, but it is quite a long list. Okay, great. Um, and Shane, from your side? Yeah, um, I think from my side, the the only stumbling block that I've only come across was the NHBRC when you have to sort of submit for clients with bonds that need uh, bank bank loans. Uh, the NHBRC, they were, they were kind of the only stumbling block so far. But now with our AGRIMA certification, I mean, of course, that take care, takes care of that uh, challenge. And I think... Um, in my opinion, most of the municipalities are very open to alternative building materials. But as um, Jacqueline also said, I think it's very important to have a good a structural engineer on board that is definitely experienced and also confident in, uh, yeah, just looking at the structure and keeping it all safe and sound. Great. Yeah, that's 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 great. I see there is a hand from Peter, and I also saw you, you post it on the chat. So you can unmute yourself and ask your question or even contribute to the conversation because it seems like you have a good uh, understanding of this building pro <laughs> approval process. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm made of building development management for the city of Cape Town. So, uh, Look, there's three ways. Basically, there's three ways to comply to the national building regulations. The one is the typical vanilla method. Then you use the 10400 series, and that's a deemed to satisfy rules. Then um, there's another way that you need to illustrate that you still comply to the functional regulations, either comply equal or better than, and that is via rational design route where you get a specialist to either do the calculations or a rational assessment to indicate that you are going to comply with the regulations. And then, obviously, congratulations with your AGRIMA certificate. That mm -hmm. now, if you get your AGRIMA certificate, they've done all the tests, and it is then more or less equal, not more or less, it is then specified in that AGRIMA certificate that it is uh, acceptable, uh, equal or better than the national building regulations to comply with. So it's a very easy way. You just need to push your local building control officer to have a look at your design and then tell you what route to follow to get it approved. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for that contribution. I see a hand from Matthew. You want to go? It's, uh... With my topic, I thought I had to attend and say something. Um, but thanks for arranging that, Marlis. Um, I recently did a building with uh, aerated concrete blocks, which also performed similarly. But um, obviously, the big question from a commercial point of view is cost. Um, what, how does the block in a non-structural form compare to, say, uh, just a regular brick facade 
also in an on so you build a framed building and then you fill in with your blocks how, how does the cost compare yeah good question i think currently our price point is a bit high seeing that we've had to import our shift all along. But I hope that with our regulation that's now changed, or at least people can apply for permits to grow their own industrial hemp, the plan is to, to obviously, <laughs> hopefully we can bring the price point down. But currently, I would say the if you compare it to, so now I did not stop too long at the technical side of my slide because of the time, but um, I mean, if you compare apples with apples, all the benefits that you have thermally with fire rating, with sound insulation, with all those things, and you compare that with a brick and mortar system that you have to beef up to actually achieve that, you'll probably spend the same money, if not more. But if you compare a brick and mortar as it is with no bells and whistles, with no the same like thermal or whatever properties, then we look at about 20 to 30 percent increase in, in price. And you also mentioned it like, of course, it's non load bearing. So you have to consider that you always need to then have a substructure that could be steel, light steel frame, timber, timber beams, you know, like um, even concrete yeah, so or brick and mortar piers, a hybrid. You, you It's literally I think there's going to be a lot of experimentation happening in the next while. But to answer your question, 20 to 30 percent more expensive. I think obviously that's an initial, like it's quite new in the country. You've st still got to get to scale and start producing and get demand going. Do you reckon you can get it down to parity in the next few years? We're hoping. So. Yeah, we, we're aiming for that. We hope, hopefully we'll, um, we'll even beat it. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, last question. Um, Compared compared to traditional, say, clay bricks, if you compare like your 110 block to a 110 brick, does it use less energy and less water to produce as well as um, sequestrating carbon and all that other good stuff? So, of course, if you consider the embodied energy of any material, of course, this it depends on where you draw the line. But I think if you take a, you were talking about a ROK brick, or a um, the clay brick is yeah. a comparison. Okay, so I think I don't have the exact answer for you on this, but all I know is that there is definitely some benefits in the sequestration, like I mentioned, because of the plant that sequestrate a lot of uh, CO2 and also on the lime side that use that to set. But on the water side, of course, you need water for the plants to grow. You need some water to probably produce the lime. I know that lime burns at a much lower temperature than cement. Um, but yeah, I don't have a clear answer for you. That's Give me fine. your details to get you a clear answer. <laughs> She's got them. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Um, be from my money. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. JR, Joseph? Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, just, a, just a comment first and then a question. Uh, Shanae, um, I'm very much familiar with Bossy there next to you in the office somewhere. Yes. Uh, I have been in that hotel with him. He showed me that whole structure. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at at building my own house with with hemp, and and we back and forward at the moment. Uh, we were looking at steel structures, uh, mm. planning, but but the cost is still a little bit too high comparing with normal bricks and mortar. In mm. in your opinion, looking at the bunch of professionals that's needed uh, to put the house up like that. I'm building a, a, a double story house at the moment, planning a double story house. Uh, how would we bring that cost down, bringing that professionals into a package sort of? Would, would Afrimet think of that as bringing the structural engineers, you're as an architect, and, and say, I say to you, this is my building. How can we put up this building at the least cost uh, compared to bricks and mortar? I'm just thinking we need to put out samples 
buildings mm. uh, to get government, you know, interested in this. My, I'm a hemp farmer myself. Uh, mm. Yeah, so so we're going to plant this season and, and probably my stocks is going to land up in Afrimet's uh, bricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. But, Thanks, Jaron. Yes. Thanks for asking the question. I know exactly who you are. You are in um, the Eastern Cape, eh? I won't, I won't disclose your location too much. But anyway, um, yeah, I think with a double story light steel frame, that's still a challenge because, of course, because it's an infill, you know, I think with light steel frame, if you go single story, you would probably achieve better um, sort of from an economical side and also performance side. But I mean, yeah, I believe I do agree with you. We do need to put uh, some package together with Agrimai. We have uh, a lot of pressure on us to obviously, when we do use our product to release a installation manual, we need to do training with all the professionals on the team in the sense of giving them the information of what is the product about and then of course, have a structural engineer that is experimented with it himself. I mean, we've got a few guys that's that's done some projects. We've got a few architects that's experimental. Um, I mean, Wolf and Wolf is by far the most experienced. They've done like buildings for the last 15 years, more in situ cost, but nonetheless, um, they have hemp. Uh, yeah, examples. But I think, JR, in your case, it would be great if you can grow your own house, not? Definitely, but yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> we need to start first, yeah. Because it will take you literally six months, you know, from planting the seeds, five months in, two weeks to dry, three week, uh, four weeks to dry the blocks, and then boom, you go. <laughs> yeah, I think the challenge, Shanae, is just with that team and, and going to the council, you know, that's that's the challenge at the moment. So so if I knew, for instance, that Afrimet got that whole team together, I could say, let's relook uh, uh, these plans. Uh, I've just got a message from Bossy this morning to ask me how far mm -hmm. I am with this thing. But I, I looking at council and the Eastern Cape is a totally other province. I'm not sure who else is in the meeting from the Eastern Cape. But, but yeah, yeah, it's a challenging uh, province to stay in. So if, we, if you can do that, I think we'll we'll get the first hemp house down here both by yourself. Thanks, Jair. But I think we need to have more conversation, me and you, and Bossy. But thanks for your contribution. Share it. Thank you. My, Thank my, you so five much. Cent, my five cent on that is a good architect and a good engineer on a project like that is going to save you a lot of time and money. That's mm. the thing. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. Marty, I see you have, your hand, have had your hand up for a while now. Thanks for the talk, guys. It was very interesting. Just a couple of questions. I did put one in the chat, but I'll happily mm. ask it. Is the mortar that you use, conventional mortar, you spoke about plasters and being lime plasters, lime-based plasters and whatever, but the actual mortar to lay your hemp blocks, are there, is that normal, normal mortar? No, you can, um, yeah, thanks for your question. You can't use cement in any of the areas of the system. I mean, we've we've uh, experimented with, with adding a little bit of cement in the beginning to our blocks, and it was actually a bit of a disaster because the outside forms a crust, the inside is still wet because it's a natural product, and mm -hmm. then there's no evaporation of the moisture so yeah you have to always stay clear of cement when you do the hemp system okay. I mean it's like in a heritage building you know you kind of your mortar your your um, you know your plasters all of that is, is is lime based and it's basically just lime and sand and water and um, yeah no cement Okay, cool. And then sort of maybe just going further from the previous guy's question, he was speaking about a double story home, but on a single story home, um, would it, when you say it's not load bearing, I mean, I understand what that means, but would that mean uh, that you couldn't even put on a, a roof uh, truss structure onto those walls, you would still have to, uh, even if it was a single story. So um, it's just to support the roof. Does that also need its no. own structure? 
Yeah, so you need a substructure to keep the roof up and then you use your um, hem blocks as infill. So you okay. can use it in, say for instance, you have a, want to use a hybrid with a brick and mortar on the outside. You can, I mean, we have a, two engineers that's now recently done um, or is working on projects like this. Um, and they, there's definitely a way that you can do it. But of course, you can't just build hemp without a substructure for your roof. Yeah. No, that, that's cool. And then I think my next question uh, it definitely won't work, but I'm just asking, you know, with a ri ribbon block type system for a slab, mm. um, if, the, if the ribs and beams were out of concrete, um, mm. then use the your blocks as the infill. But I think there's, their non-structural um, abilities would uh, be a problem. Because it, it would yeah. give you a nice, a nice lightweight structure, <laughs> like you were, you were busy saying, you know, from a lightweightness, it might be able to <clears throat> have, have double benefit. But what you were saying with, um, like, putting a screed over the top, if it can't be cementitious, then it probably wouldn't work. Yeah, on your floor, you can use cement. I mean, if, if that is what you want to do. But, I, yeah, I, you can't... Um... The, the the hemp can't carry any structure, so that's the only thing. And then if you, um, like the slide that I had where there was a, a brick and mortar wall and then there was a hemp wall right next to each other. I mean, you can incorporate, you can do a hybrid in materials, mm. but obviously it's important to always, like I said, your um, joints for waterproofing, for all those things, They it's quite important to just respect that, you know, expansion joints and all of that, because it's different materials. They respond differently on heat, on cold, on different things. 100%. No, that's cool. And then, um, I, I mean, when, when I was at WITS in the early 90s, um, there was already Agrimar certificates being spoken about. And um, I, I seem to remember there was a product which was uh, corrugated cardboard with a little wax coating and then there was like a mesh on the outside and I mean that got approval but I personally have not seen any of them <laughs> ever built in my working career so I mean I, I don't know how, how um, the approval of the Agrimar certificate is one thing but it doesn't necessarily mean people's mindsets actually ab adopt what, what's been approved and I think that's a, a big issue I mean the, the company uh, it was actually my sort of first attempt at a discourse uh, doing a study on that stuff and yeah i, I just um how many other products um ha have have got a agrimar but have still not been adopted in the in the market it's, it's concerning yeah it's very true i mean the way the way it works of course is that we have the building code with SABS, and then we have innovation. And innovation falls under Agrima and used to be part of the CSIR. Now it's, I think, public works. But the bottom line is, I hear what you're saying, and I, I'm, um, I mean, I'm an experimental kind of person. So for me, experimentation comes so natural. But, um, I mean, light steel frame, for instance, is a, is a success story that comes from an Agrima certification. So that's that's at least one. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully, him the next one, right? <laughs> no, well, the, w wish you guys all the best of luck and hope you can get the price right. Because at the end of the day, that's kind of yeah. what counts. People will will build with it if it lasts and if it's if it's less costly. Um, we, we need to kind of be honest with ourselves. Um, and let's let's hope you guys can get it right because it's it's friendlier to the environment, and I think that's a big underlying aspect that needs mm. to be pushed. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Thanks, thanks, Marty. Reading through the questions, but I think most of the questions have been answered. So I'm going to ask uh, Jacqueline another question. Like, what was the most fun part of the project when, like, with regards to the materials? What did you enjoy most as the architect? And and maybe following up on uh, Marty's question as well, is like how can we promote these kind of materials more in, in, in the building design of, of our projects? Sure, Marlis. I think the most exciting part is hearing that you've got the opportunity to do a building like um, the Helderberg Visitor Center where you can experiment and, and construct a building not just with one um, environmental product but two or three or four of them 
So that was very exciting. But I think for me, the highlight was the rammed earth wall. I, I mentioned it in my presentation, putting your hand on that wall is, is something else. It's like walking in a big forest and putting your hand on one of those big trees that are a thousand years old. It feels the same. I think there's something very humbling in having an earth element like sand becoming a structural element like a wall. Um, and I think um, that's what I like about the hemp product as well, is I think you're going to have the same sense when you're in an, a room or a building that's got that, um, there's acoustically something different about these materials. Um, I think they appeal to a, a very natural, um, very ancient part of our being. And, and, and I think that's the, that's the specialness of, of doing natural buildings. Um, I think what I'd like to say about that is they're not cost effective. And I, especially on the rammed earth walls and the tire walls and that, yes, it's earth, yes, it's tires, we can get them anywhere. But even our building, we could have done it much cheaper if we had just gone the conventional way in, in doing this building. But if we had done that, I wouldn't be talking to you today and I wouldn't be presenting a building of this nature. And I think that's where the magic lies. The magic lies in it's a special type of person that's going to want this product for their home, for their office, for their corporate environment. They're going to be people that are environmentally conscious. They're going to be people that want to push the boundaries and they're going to be people that want something different. And we all know that, you know, if you want that something different, it's, it's probably going to cost a little bit more. Um, I think we're a long way off of these very original building materials becoming mainstream. You know, China is very good at making products that we can get very cheap and build building e buildings economically very cheap um, for today's commercial environment. But if you want something different and you want something that is going to stand out um, and be present in its own footprint, then this is the type of building materials you need to look at. Yeah, and it's and it's the, the 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 project is a great example, and we actually have to present more of the examples to make people aware that it can be done, and um, yeah, that it and it can be look beautiful as well. Shane, do you want to like highlight the most exciting part of the project? And 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 another question I had for you was like, is the building going to be completely naturally ventilated? Yes. So there is a tabs system in the in the building now okay. i can't remember what it stands thermal thermal what does it stand for? thermally activated yes building system yes exactly building system so what it, <laughs> yes yes so what it basically is is um embedded pipes in the concrete slab that heat and cool the slab so i mean that is uh, run by a heat exchanger if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So I mean, I think as as far as it could be naturally ventilated. But the thing with um, with hemp walls is also it, it feels to me like it almost breathes a bit, if I can say that. So if you're in a, in in the actual building at the moment, it it and I I'm Jacqueline also touched on it. You know, there's a different feel to it. So yeah. But I mean, uh, highlights. Um, I think for me, it's very exciting that, um, yeah, that in America, hemp is not part of their building code, and I think that's what we 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 aiming for, um, and I think it's exciting that we could be in this position where we could actually embrace something and such an amazing product as hemp, that. Um, you know, have there there are so many benefits, um, not just on a on a natural sort of CO2 level. I mean, there's there's also just you know, if you look at a hemp plant in general, I mean, they it's amazing that we in the in the hemp industry can have a chance at at doing things better in many different industries, but also in the building industry. So I think for me, that's probably the, the highlight is that we have this opportunity and I, I hope we could, we could do our best to, you know, to like, a, like the guy, the gentleman also asked in the beginning to bring the price point down, 
you know, to include subsidiary farmers, to actually have people farming their own homes in a way and then build, you know, their own houses. I mean, how amazing will that be? For, on so many levels, you know. So that would be so maybe, amazing, yeah. <laughs> maybe P and me is now popping out, but anyway. <laughs> and and the the building is also going to be excited because it's going to be an Airbnb. So actually, people are gonna or a hotel. So it, people are gonna experience what it is like to be in a in a hemp building, and hopefully they would have a very positive and um, experience with that. That's amazing. Any other questions from attendees? I see JR's hand is still up, but I have got another one. Uh, I... <laughs> we we have the three uh, <laughs> the three the three musketeers here of asking questions. JR, did you want to ask a question, or is that still an old hand? Uh, I think it was so, an old. Sorry, hand. it's an okay. old hand. Sorry. Okay, great, no problem. Marty, you want to ask yours? Yeah, cool. Thanks. So, just on the tires, out of interest, I mean, did, did I, I would have thought that tires and their disposal is a massive problem in the world. And there's these places where the tires are just burning and burning and burning. In a way, would would people not almost be able to pay you to take their tires to put into a building? So there's almost a an incentive to use them is that um i'm not too sure like when you did your building did the tires just come for free or did you end up having to pay for them and this is like the the, the whole thing with slag it, it used to be a complete waste product making mountains of little balls and then eventually it was made into bricks and then they were selling it so i'm just you know is there a point where the demand actually starts making the product less able to be used uh yes uh, the tires we used was Free, um, again, donated by the roads department because they've obviously got a stockpile of, of the um, road maintenance vehicles that they have. But yes, I mean, as tire walls become a thing, it's a business opportunity. I'm sure that that can be sold, sold back to the construction industry. It's, as I say, building a business opportunity. We have various questions, especially because this building is built in a nature reserve, um, saying, well, why are we using tires? You know, it's a, it's a rubbish material you're bringing into a, a nature reserve. But the point is we're using it, we're repurposing it, and we used it as a wall. So um, that was our argument there. Um, but we did get some of the Helderberg, um, what nature lovers, Helderberg, people that um, did have some questions regarding putting tires back into a nature reserve, but part of the building and it's recycling of, as you say, landfill material that is really toxic to the environment. And then my last question uh, for, for the other lady, um, as you mentioned when they were doing the fire test up to a thousand degrees and how, how much smell there was. I'm just interested, uh, wh what sort of smell was it? Was it the same sort of smell as normal burning <laughs> hemp and possibly that uh, affected the guy's ability to read the, the read the test uh, to, to allow you to pass <laughs> i was actually expecting that but it yeah it, it was it was funny no it it was um not a smell that you could smell there but afterwards it was pretty smelly but yeah, no, it was it was an interesting experience. I mean, I was a bit worried that we're all going to be high as a kite, but yeah, no, we were all we were all fine. I think. I don't okay, know. because no, I think I... that's the, that's the one thing that you know always comes up as the first joke when someone starts talking about a hemp pass. You can, you know, what happens if it burns down? You're all going to get high and whatever. So I was just interested to get the real answer. <laughs> yeah, no, true. No, I mean, if, if if I can if I can count the amount of time I heard that joke, I'd be if I get a rant, I'll be a millionaire. <laughs> cool, right. thanks. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> uh, <that's laughs> thanks, <Marty. laughs> for that. Uh, and I'm gonna allow one more question from Matthew, and then we're gonna wrap up. Uh, Matthew, you wanna ask the last question? It's not a question. It's just a comment. So, okay. just relating back to the aerated concrete blocks, it's. Um, the journey to get a uh, material accepted is like a two or three step process. The first thing is to, if you need code, get the code written. And that's a relatively time consuming but straightforward step. So if you need code written, you, you go to the get your agreement certificate, you get all that stuff done. The second thing is to get to scale. And obviously, AFRIMAT 
and they go hand in hand. Once the code's written, people are more willing and able to use it. Okay, until then, you kind of just got to do rational designs by the engineer. Um, and once you do that, then you, you start pushing into the market. If you look at AAC, I think it's only five or 10 years old, but it's already getting to the point. Well, Everite told me they can't keep up with demand. It's a similar kind of product. It's a lightweight aerated concrete block. It's obviously not nearly as good. It's a lot of cement, a lot of energy, a lot of baking, but the process for acceptance has been the same. And the selling points where it's lightweight quality, especially for multi-story buildings. Once you're over seven stories, you actually save money with your construction because the lightness lets you reduce your foundation costs. So obviously you've got to focus on the, the qualities of, of the product. Uh, one of the similar kind of energy performance on our last building, actually, Malus, you guys did the modeling and you, you gave us a reduction of 40% on the heating bills and the cooling bills. So, the, so there's some huge advantages at certain scales and that's those are the kind of things you have to learn how to drive into the market to get them to work. Yeah, and then and like you're saying, like the costing, like the costing of the foundations that cost well, that, would then yeah. provide the saving, and that's often not calculated through uh, with the benefits of these alternative materials. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matthew, for your last question. Just want to mention the upcoming events. Next month's event is around uh, the design process for regenerative buildings. So how do we actually, you know, what needs to be changed in the design process for us to get to more regenerative buildings in South Africa? And then in November, we're going to talk about regenerative hospitality projects and looking at some examples of yeah, uh, hotels and lodges on the continent. And then in December, we're going to take a break to regenerate um, very much. And then we'll, we'll start again in January. So again, if you have an idea, please drop them to us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and lastly, thank you to our sponsor for making this webinar possible. They can air conditioning. We really appreciate your support. And then a really big thank you to our speakers, both uh, Jackie and Shanae. You've done a great job in presenting and answering all the questions. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time that you made available for this webinar. And then lastly, check out our previous events on Greenet. And with that, I'm going to say good evening. And I'm going to hope you have, an, have a wonderful evening. And thank you for attending this webinar and see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.